great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be invited and to speak on this topic. Um, so I just want to start um, by acknowledging the traditional custodians and the lands in which we collectively meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So as Paula mentioned, uh, I am Canadian and I moved here in January 2020, just a few weeks ahead of the pandemic. So it was quite an exciting time for myself and my family. Um, of course, I was in Toronto during the previous pandemic and so had some experience with what to expect. Um, but I just thought I'd offer some reflections to sort of, I guess, set the stage for the things that I'm gonna talk about today. And that is that I really do believe that Australia is behind in its data health infrastructure, uh, particularly when you compare to Canada, the US or some uh, European countries, uh, particularly in terms of its use and its really ability to drive change within the health system. And really, I think Australia's access process really for real world data um, is just complex and time consuming. And I think most of you who have tried to access any of the real world data um, for your own research projects would um, probably understand what I mean by this statement. Um, and, you know, interestingly, Ed Wilder James um, in the Harvard Business Review just you know, I, I like this quote because he said the biggest obstacle to using advanced data analysis isn't skill based or technology, it's plain old access to the data. And I would agree with that comment because uh, we really do have the skills, I think, particularly in Queensland and the Digital Health Center to actually um, apply quite sophisticated modeling techniques to help drive change in the system, but really gaining access to the data is, is a bit of a struggle. And so it's one of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So a little bit about the Queensland Digital Health Centre and, and our vision. And um, we're a relatively new centre. We're just about one year old at this point. But the vision for the centre is really um, to uh, digitally enable a learning healthcare system and really deliver on the quadruple aim of healthcare. And really data is at its core. So data access, data use uh, is absolutely fundamental to the work that we do. And it would be impossible to do the vast majority of the projects that we undertake uh, without accessing data in some way. And really what we think about is really trying to have easily accessible data for both clinical care delivery, uh, for planning and policy development, and of course, research and innovation. And so it's in each of these three areas that we think about how can we streamline data access and use and making sure that the right data and information gets to the right person at the right time. So part of our vision actually is the creation of something called the Smart Hub. Um, and in Queensland, the Smart Hub uh, is really a group of clinical informaticians um, that um, comprise a, a wider team that will assist researchers in Queensland um, to access, in particular, the IEMR data or the single instance of the electronic medical record that's available in most um, public hospitals in Queensland. And so Queensland, I mean, uniquely positioned in terms of its data access in some ways, because we do have this single instance of an IEMR that's been deployed across all public hospitals. Um, so that means that the data is already sort of in a common data model, if you will, in the sense that, you know, the way um, an event occurs at one hospital and is recorded in the EMR is exactly the way that that same event would be recorded in the EMR at a different hospital. And so there's no uh, having to figure out how to assimilate and, and create a common data model. It already exists here. Um, but gaining access to that data, of course, is, is, an, is an issue. And there's obviously quite a long uh, process associated with that, which I'll get to in a minute. But the, this team is um, a team led by Jody Austin. Jody's a PhD trained um, uh, pharmacist, uh, and she was part of the original IMR implementation uh, in Queensland at PA Hospital and subsequently worked for Queensland Health before we managed to uh, bring her over to the university uh, to help us with this. But she manages um, quite a large team of clinical staff, both pharmacists, nurses, and other clini clinical people, as well as um, quite sophisticated technical staff, um, including software developers, uh, computer programmers, and data managers. And so her team really is able to help deliver, if you will, um, the data access that we're hoping for. And in fact, her team actually have conjoint appointments with Queensland Health. Uh, and because of that, they actually um, are able to fill data requests on behalf of Queensland Health um, for research. So, so they're sort of co-branded, if you will, or co-employed by both Queensland Health and the university. So some of the work that Jody's done over the last year is really um, building standing operating procedures for accessing the IMR. So, because there's a lot of people who say they want the data, but as you can imagine, the IMR is quite large. There's a lot of tables in the background. Um, and so really figuring out how you might get the information that you want out of the IMR needs a little bit of translation. And that's where Jody's team really works one-on-one -on -one with researchers to help clarify that. 
in addition, um, she supports uh, the governance process. So that leads me to, you know, really what is the access process for health data? And the next slide I'm going to show you is, is not necessarily meant for you to read, although if you would like a copy, um, you can contact Jody's team or go to the QDEC website. But essentially, this is the process for accessing IMR data for research. Uh, so this is the ethics and governance process. Um, and you can see that it's quite complex. There are multiple layers that you have to go through. Um, there are some things that can be done um, simultaneously, and there are other things that need to be done in a particular order or sequence. And so Jody's team, although she doesn't um, complete any of this documentation or drive any of this for any researchers, she does um, lay out the process uh, with which this has to happen. And of course, we haven't developed this process. This process, in fact, is the process that has been developed by the legislation and the interpretation of that by Queensland Health. Uh, but really, we're just putting uh, a visual representation to this in a flow diagram so that researchers understand the steps that they need to take. Um, so what are those data access steps in Queensland? Well, the first one, of course, is to identify your data sources. And so um, you can refer to the data custodian list and that's available in Queensland here um, from uh, uh, Queensland Health. Uh, and from an EMR standpoint, we don't really release actually the entire um, EMR data or coding scheme. Uh, so you really need to talk to Jody to figure out uh, how you would translate the data elements that you want and find those essentially in the IMR. Of course, then you would move on and get ethics approval. Um, and if you're using IMR data, uh, you actually need to go to the Queensland Health um, ethics uh, application uh, and then get ratification from your university, whatever university that you happen to be at. Ultimately, that will also lead to a public health act, um, assuming this unconsented information that you're interested in. Of course, then there's data sharing agreements that need to be signed. Um, there's site specific approvals. So each hospital um, actually does require that you access um, data from, does require um, to approve that access. And so the more uh, public hospitals you add to the list of places you would like the information from, you actually do need to go to each of those sites and get a site specific approval. Uh, and then ultimately you go to the research governance office uh, and all HHSs are essentially involved with that research governance office. And then finally the health, informa health information management service uh, approval or HIMSS approval. So you can see this is basically the steps that are outlined on that previous flow diagram with a, a, a few extra details in the flow diagram. But you can see how this process is quite long and quite complex. And, and, and rightly, I think it should be. It's, it's very personal information, obviously, that's captured about individuals. And, and you know, we're not um, professing that we should just you know, throw the doors open on the data. It does need to be controlled. Uh, access needs to be controlled. So the question though is how can we actually do this better? And the way that we think that we can do this better is actually through using synthetic data. And synthetic data really um, falls on a continuum. And really at the one end of the continuum is the identifiable patient data. So this is real patient data with personally identifiable information. Um, this is essentially the data that would be stored, for example, in the IMR. And as we start moving along the continuum a little bit, you might think about de-identified or masked um, patient data. So this is, again, real patient data where personal identifying information has been removed. I prefer to call this coded information uh, simply because I find it very difficult to actually get to a, a point where you can call the data um, de-identified or anonymized. Uh, and that's owing to the fact that once you know certain um, characteristics about the data or certain things that have occurred to that individual from a health standpoint, you can start to see how it's actually quite individual, even if the person's name and address and other identifiers, um, the sort of traditional identifiers, in fact, aren't included. So this is what we would call the real data. So you have this um, identifiable patient data and then some sort of coded patient data that you can use often for research purposes. And as we move along the spectrum for synthetic data, we now think about non-representative synthetic data. So this is data where it reflects the true metadata, but the distributions are random. So what do I mean by that? Well, in the EMR parlance, we would be able to generate, if we were gonna generate a non-representative synthetic data set, we would take the structure of the data as it would come out of the EMR, but we just wouldn't give you the data. What we would do is we would put distributions or random data um, into that, uh, data structure so that you could look at it. And this really helps researchers in some in a, in a variety of ways, uh, one of which is to actually know what the data will look like when you get it. And they can actually, while they're awaiting the approvals process, they can actually start 
um, you know, writing code on how to actually uh, work with that data structure and really figure out how they're going to put it through their analysis pipeline. Moving up from that would be semi-representative synthetic data. So again, this follows the true metadata. So you'll get a data set that looks in fields essentially like the data that would come out of the MR, except the data is no longer random that's put in there. The, the values um, for the data elements that you've selected actually would follow some published sources or distributions of published sources. So this means things like if you had asked for blood pressure, for example, um, we would be able to give you a systolic blood pressure that was in a, a normal human range. Um, so that the data wouldn't be random, it would actually kind of look real. But of course, the relationships between those things, in fact, um, would not be real. Um, and then the Next is actually moving to fully representative synthetic data or what we would call digital twinning. And this is actually where you take a, a, an identifiable data set perhaps or even a, a coded data set and then you actually run it through a process which I'll explain in a minute and you actually create a digital twin for this data. And so in creating this digital twin, all of the multivariate distributions um, are simulated from the real patient data and therefore the distributions in the synthetic data actually hold true. So if there's a relationship between blood pressure and age or blood pressure, age and gender, those relationships would actually exist in the synthetic data. But of course the synthetic data is just that, it's synthetic and doesn't actually reference any individual in particular. And so collectively, we would call those non-representative, semi-representative, and representative data all on the synthetic um, side of the, of the data continuum. So the interesting part is, is you know, the, representative of the, of the representativeness of the data essentially does slide down a little bit as you go, right? So if you're going to actually create a synthetic data set that is a replica or a digital twin of the data, you do lose a little bit of fidelity in general, but the fidelity loss is quite minimal. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But the interesting part is, is that the disclosure risk, of course, um, precipitously drops. So the fact is, is that if you have a data set that is fully synthetic, is a digital twin, um, it acts and behaves like the real data, but in actual fact, does not reference any one individual. And so therefore, that data from a disclosure standpoint and a privacy standpoint um, is quite protective. So you might say to yourself, well, how do we go about doing this? Well, um, you know, the advent of AI is really what's allowed us to do this in, in the last few years. So this is a relatively cutting edge area um, in, in terms of even what's happening on the research side uh, in terms of generation of synthetic data. And it has only really come to the fore in the last sort of four or five years. But as an example, this is of course, the picture of the Sydney Opera House, which I've been to several times. It's a beautiful building. And you will know from already things that you've seen in the in the, in the you know, public media and things like that, that AI can do some pretty fun things. So if you feed it a picture of the Sydney Opera House, and then you ask an AI algorithm to say, redesign the Sydney Opera House in the form of what Gaudi, for example, might um, you know, have designed if he was gonna design the Sydney Opera House, you might get a picture like this. And so the data inputs for um, a model, uh, a computer model like this is to say, well, here's the building that we want. It has to look something like this but please also look at Gaudi's images of his architecture and then figure out how the two would sort of go together. And so you get these very photorealistic images, for example, of, of what it would look like if Gaudi had designed it. And subsequently, you know, you can pick any architect you'd like <laughs> and put it through and say, well, look, here's some images of Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. And if he was gonna design the Sydney Opera House, what would it look like? And so here you go. So this kind of image generation, I think, is the thing that people um, have some experience with or have seen uh, in, you know, the popular media. Um, and I think, you know, this is another example of where the models can actually create synthetic data. So all of the faces on this page that I'm showing you actually are not real. They are photorealistic regenerations of, of human faces uh, that have been generated by AI. And in fact, you can go to generated.photos slash faces and you can generate whatever faces you want. In fact, as you can see from the filters down the side, you can filter the faces to be of a particular um, sex, age, ethnicity, eye color, hair color, length. You can even adjust the emotion that you wanna see in the photo. Um, and then the system will actually generate those images for you using the AI algorithm in the background. And then you can use those images for whatever it is that you'd like to use those images for. Um, 
Uh, and in actual fact, if you go to this website, generated.photos, you can actually even generate full people. And so, uh, you know, advertising agencies are starting to use this instead of real models uh, because they can control them much easier, of course. And if they want to tweak it a little bit, they can just have the AI model change a little bit of the facial feature or something that they're interested in. So this kind of synthetic data generation really does exist. Uh, and as I said, so there's almost no difference in terms of generating that those images that I showed you as it would be to generating a data table that we would use, for example, in an analysis of a research project. So how does this synthetic data generation really work? Well, you have this real data. And so that would be, for example, the tables of the real data that we would pull from the IMR for any given research project. It ultimately would go through an AI generator in the same way, and that is a little bit of an iterative process. Um, and then ultimately you would end up with this synthetic data in the same way that you would feed certain photos of the Opera House and Gaudi's work, and then you would ask it, the generator to actually put those things together, if you will, and create a synthetic um, image in the same way you can do that for the, for the data, uh, any sort of data table that you wanna create. So the generator um, uses AI models to create that digital twin. And you know, you might say, well, you need a lot of data because you've, you, you know, you might have heard in, in the news that that um, AI requires a lot of data. It turns out that actually some of the AI generators that are available now can actually duplicate data sources that are quite small, so often as small as 100 records, uh, and they can generate them quite well, up to really the maximum is limited by the compute power with which you have the generator uh, existing, so that that you know however many records you want, it can generate for you. Um, and of course, the data can be complex and relational. And so I think that's one of the keys. So, so it doesn't need to be what we would call a flat file where it's a single couple of rows of information about an individual. You can actually have um, a patient table, for example, that has patient information. And then you can have a procedures table that has multiple procedures perhaps per patient. And in fact, it can understand that those tables are linked um, and knows that you know, this five procedures actually belongs to this person in the person table. And then when it generates the synthetic data, it will take that into account when it generates it. Um, the other thing that's also really interesting uh, about the synthetic data and, and the AI generators that are available to do this is that it doesn't require, um, it's, it's not required to know how you intend to analyze the data when you generate the digital twin. So you don't a priori have to specify that I'm gonna do a particular analysis technique or that I'm interested in this focal question. In fact, the AI generators work better if you just ask it to replicate or create that digital twin of the data as it stands. So how do we go about thinking about how you might evaluate whether that synthetic data seems representative of the real data? And there's a number of processes that can happen and ways that we can think about this. So this is essentially what I've already shown you in the process, but you can add on to this process something that's called an evaluator. So this is now a series of mathematical models uh, in the evaluator space that then can calculate for you what the utility and privacy is. And so by utility, I mean, how close is that data actually to the real data that you got? Are the relationships that we saw in the real data actually representative of the relationships in the synthetic data? And then on the privacy side, we can actually calculate what the disclosure, the redisclosure risk is. And I'll explain this in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, but there are actually mathematical formulas that are used to determine disclosure risk. And so you can actually um, specify what level of disclosure risk you're willing to do. And in fact, it becomes a bit of a feedback loop where the evaluator, of course, has access to the real data. Um, and essentially the evaluator, after you generate the synthetic data, the evaluator evaluates it for both utility and privacy. If it doesn't meet the thresholds that you've set, in fact, it will send those evaluation results back to the AI generator. The AI generator learns from that. It will then regenerate the synthetic data and keep going on a loop until you actually uh, meet the thresholds that you've set in terms of privacy and utility. So, what are we actually thinking about that you could use the synthetic data for? Because you might say, well, it's synthetic. You've made it all up. And in actual fact, of course, that's true. But of course, we've made it up such the relationships um, that exist within the data are the same as the relationships that exist in the real data. And so really, any way that you can use the data, um, the real data, you should be able to use the synthetic data. So from an external data sharing standpoint, um, you can imagine that you know all of the statistical analyses and the machine learning that you want to do on that data can actually be done using um, the synthetic data. 
obviously it helps with collaborations and partnerships. So in some ways it can replace federated learning systems. So, um, you know, instead of spending 18 months to two years getting all the approvals in place to actually create a federated learning system, you might be able to simulate the data in a couple of weeks and then actually share that simulated data amongst your teams. Uh, because of that data not being real, um, it's a little bit easier, if you will, to share across jurisdictionally, for example, um, out of state or out of country. Um, of course, it can also help with vendor evaluation. So if you're trying to develop new digital tools, those vendors sometimes need access, if you will, to the real data to really understand how those tools are going to perform. And that's often a real sticking point with how we actually develop new digital tools. And um, it's difficult to gain access um, uh, to data for those purposes. But you can imagine if you were able to generate a synthetic data set uh, that looks and feels like the real data, you could actually um, provide that to the vendor and they could use it in, a, in particularly prescribed ways. And then of course, there's various outsourcing that you can do in terms of IT and other sort of operational functions. And then internally, of course, you can you could use synthetic data even internally. So, um, you know, within Queensland Health, we don't necessarily like to share all that data with everybody, right? You have to be credentialed. You have to have a reason to access that data. And so, there are ways that you would go about actually um, using synthetic data even internally for statistical analysis. In the same way, software testing. You might even set up an, a training data set so that. Um, individuals can train on how to do various things within the health system around the data, but in fact, they're not actually looking at real patient data during that training. So there are some examples where the Digital Health Center actually has used this. So this is a really a vendor evaluation example. So this is a, uh, a research study that was done uh, in, in collaboration with Health and Wellbeing Queensland, and we were interested in creating um, basically an obesity dashboard for the state. Um, and so we generated um, semi-representative synthetic data in order to populate the dashboard because the actual values in the dashboard were not really allowed to be shared with all of the partners who were involved in actually creating the dashboard. And yet we still needed to have people look at the dashboard and interact with the dashboard and you know, tell us where they think it could be improved. Um, and so in order to do that, we had to generate some synthetic data um, and really then populate the dashboard and allow it for um, use. So, um, Thinking a little bit more about the methods for privacy and utility evaluation. So on the privacy side, there is this thing around what we call attribution disclosure that gets measured and can be measured by the evaluator. And this is the fact that, or, or this is the scenario where, you know, you can identify a real individual, for example, that has particular identified features. So for example, I'm male and I'm 50. And so you might find someone in the synthetic data that is male and 50. And then because you found that individual in the synthetic data, you might actually learn something about the real person uh, because there's additional synthetic data available about that individual. And so there is this actual, this is a real potential for disclosure risk in the way that the data is generated. And in fact, you can estimate the probability uh, of this occurring, and that's really what that evaluator does. And then you can assess it against commonly accepted risk thresholds um, or even set your own custom thresholds. So, you know, you might think, well, we don't have these commonly accepted risk thresholds, but in fact, we do. So, for example, um, a lot of data that gets shared in this way, you know, you get individual data as a researcher. And then when you go to publish it, your data sharing agreement limits the cell sizes that you can publish. So you can only publish cells that have more than six individuals in them, for example. And that's a way to protect privacy or maybe even 11, um, you know, persons in an individual cell. Um, and so it really depends on the data custodian and what they um, think their threshold is, but those thresholds exist. And in fact, you can convert that threshold into a numeric value that the evaluator can then use uh, to determine whether your synthetic data actually meets that risk um, of, of privacy or, or, or attribution disclosure. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about um, utility and whether that whether that synthetic data that's been generated actually does look and perform um, the same as the real data. And so there's a number of ways to do that. I've listed a few here. So expert discrimination is one of those ways. So this is where you take subject matter experts uh, and you give them a data set where part of the data set is synthetic data and some of it's real. And then you ask those subject matter experts to classify whether they think it's real or not. And of course, um, you know, if your synthetic data is performing the same as the um, as the real data, then the subject matter experts likely shouldn't be able to identify what has been generated and what is considered real. 
There's also generic utility methods um, on to look at how um, you know how how real the data feels and behaves. And then there's this idea of what's called workload aware utility, which is really demonstrating how well the synthetic data can be a proxy for the real data in a in a in a very specific kind of analysis. And I'll talk about that in a second. Well, actually, right now. So the that's really um, the workload aware utility um, is also thought of as parallel result assessment. So essentially, what you do is you have this real data available. It's been generated through an AI process or a generator to create that synthetic data. You then move on and you do the analysis on the real data. You do the same analysis on the synthetic data, hence why there's an equal sign between them. So you do the exact same analysis. And then subsequently, you compare the results that you get from the real data with the results that you get from the synthetic data. And then you make an assessment of whether, in fact, those results are the same. And so really, this parallel results assessment is really what's been um, published a fair bit in the literature. And in fact, it's showing um, that most of the synthetic data that's generated in particular ways um, actually does do quite well in terms of performing and being a good digital twin. And so I think we're probably not quite at the point yet where we would say every data that we would generate from a synthetic standpoint um, has that parallel result assessment or high enough quality, but I think we're getting pretty close. We're getting to the point where almost every time people do this, we see that the result is strong, in which case we know that the AI models that are being used to actually generate that synthetic data are in fact um, doing as they should. So um, just in conclusion, I just um, wanted to just I guess wrap up with a few ideas. One is that complexity and time required for governance really makes data access process difficult. Um, but we think that the synthetic data can help with that. Um, Non-representative and semi-representative synthetic data really does allow projects to progress while awaiting governance process um, or even vendor uh, access to um, you know, non-representative or semi-representative synthetic data. Um, representative synthetic data, which is the, you know, the full digital twinning, really does have the ability to preserve privacy in many research situations. Um, and obviously you get to set those, you can put in an evaluator in place and then actually set those um, thresholds for privacy um, so that you know when the data has been generated, you have numeric um, essentially proof that, that in fact this data is or is not difficult to re-identify. And then the representative synthetic data, I mean, still does need some utility assessment in, in, in many situations, but really, as I said, there's this growing body of evidence slowly changing that prevailing thought. So the thought is, is that as we generate these data sets, we really should do that parallel assessment or other assessments uh, for validity. But in fact, now as that body of evidence is growing, it's, it's starting to look like probably we don't need to do that so much. So at that point, I will stop and say thank you um, for inviting me. And if uh, I'm happy to take any questions now or at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. That was really very interesting. We have a question in the Q&A from Laura who wants to know what the security is like on these AI generators. Yeah, so the AI generators are interesting, right? So there are, you can um, purchase access to one of these AI generators. So there are commercially available softwares, if you will, that will do this for you. Those commercially available softwares actually are kind of available, if you will, in two main flavors. One flavor is that they're available in the cloud and you share your data into the cloud. And obviously there's security procedures associated with that. And then the AI generator generates that data and then makes that data set available. Um, some data custodians don't feel really comfortable with that because your data is being launched into the cloud. Uh, and so a lot of them will allow another flavor of the generator where you can actually have the generator located within your own firewall. So you basically buy a copy of the standalone software. It works in the background um, in your own space. I will say though that um, most EMRs across most hospitals now in the world are actually all stored in the cloud now. So that sort of uncomfortableness, I think, um, is really a legacy of potentially people not actually understanding actually how most of this data is actually distributed and actually accessed. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, if you think about um, uh, ethics applications and ethics boards reviewing this, you, you know, mm -hmm. I think there probably is, it takes a little while for the education to catch up and for people to realize that in fact, most of this is actually happening in the cloud now, because uh, that's actually where most of the data is stored and actually generating those things are safe um, in that space. Terrific, thank you. Uh, we have somebody with a hand up, Lillian, you have a question? We've got time for one more. <laughs> 
Lily, she's, taking, she's taking it down now, Paula. So uh, clearly, clearly, uh, no other question. Jason, uh, maybe just to finish, and I see Gail's on there. Um, I mean, you didn't men. I mean, you know, the, the, it, it's it's also awesome using synthetic data, and I know, of course, we were talking previously about uh, about your 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 vault, your repository vault, and so the combination of those two clearly provides a you know a very useful security um, around the use of data. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things I probably didn't stress enough in the talk is that that once you've generated the synthetic data, it's it, you don't just publish it on some public website. There are still governance procedures that are required in how you use and access mm -hmm. that data. So, you know, the same procedures that we have in place to say, well, you've agreed you're only going to analyze the data to answer these questions or questions in this vein, and you can't stray out of that. I think will still exist. I think that still needs to exist to protect the data. And um, so this isn't this isn't a way to sort of generate an entire EMR and then just make it available publicly, although I suppose you could, but I don't think that that's reasonable. And I think probably most consumers don't think that's reasonable. So I think there are still protections that need to be in place. And that includes storing the synthetic data in secure environments that really then, you know, make sure that it's not going to be accessed inappropriately. Mm -hmm. Jason. If you have a